Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you have, uh, have a good day so far. Uh, before introducing our next guest speaker, I would like to uh, mention something about the venue management and uh, the break that, coffee breaks that we have. Uh, first of all, please make sure that your cell phone is in silent mode and please uh, don't leave the venue during the lecture. So let's uh, start the afternoon session. I'm very pleased to introduce our next guest speaker, Dr. Svetlana Pizgalova. And uh, Svetlana is an assistant professor in finance at Stanford Graduate School of Business. I had the chance to meet Svetlana uh, several years ago at LSE. She was uh, the top student in the whole university, so I'm very pleased to uh, have a Svetlana today here. Uh, without uh, further ado, please join me uh, in welcoming Svetlana. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure. Um, and thank you, Ali, for very kind words. OK, so the topic of my lecture today is going to be time series predictability in the stock market. I would like to start with a bit of history. As soon as the slides load. Yeah. Do you know what is this? Sorry? Dome? Dome. And what is on top of that dome? Oops. It is not a cross and it is not a clock. It's a weather vent. So basically, it's an arrow that indicates the direction of the wind. Okay? Now, of course, you can find similar weather events on many different roofs in many different countries. The question is, why am I showing to you this one in particular? The interesting thing about this dome is that it belongs to the Bank of England. Okay? So this is actually uh, the weather event which is standing on top of the roof of the Bank of England, the central bank of UK. And what is more, within one of the main holes in the same bank, there is a special dial that is connected to that vent so that the central bankers that decide on policy decisions and everything else, they see the direction of the wind. Now, the key question is, why? Why would they need that? I mean, obviously, apart from the usual phrase that uh, regulators tend to lean against the wind, is there any fundamental reason for that? And the answer is going to go back about 200 years ago, when this thing was first installed in 1805. The reason was very simple. At that time, a lot of the trade was obviously done um, by sea. And marine engine, marine steam engine, hasn't been invented yet. So the only way that the merchant ships could actually reach the port of London was when the wind was blowing west. So when the bankers saw that there was the west wind, they understood that there will be more ships coming and they will be bringing goods. So they need to re give credit to the local merchants in order for them to be able to buy the produce. When the wind was blowing east, that means that all the ships will be leaving the port and they will be coming back and do their own business, go to other countries, so on and so forth. So all this extra credit money would need to be taken out of the market in order to basically not to have much inflation. This is one of the most prominent historical examples of how different indicators for predictability, in this case it was predictability for demand of money, has been used by not just people who try to make advantage of it, like merchants, for example, but also by regulators. Okay. So, what changed since then? Predictability is still a big issue. And predictability basically affects every single market participant that you can think. Not only traders, but obviously researchers that try to understand what exactly is going on on the market. And it influences lots of many different things. Obviously, portfolio management which securities to invest, when, in which amounts, all this is going to be related to the predictability. Different welfare implication, how different people within the same economy are going to thrive, whether the income inequality is going to increase or not, what is, should be the optimal policy response to the way markets are behaved. Again, this is all going to be rooted in the question of predictability and what it means for the market participants. 
we, people from academia, are obviously interested in understanding the nature of this predictability because it is a very important feature of the data. So it is essential for us to understand it in order to model appropriately the structure of the economy and advise policymakers. Okay. So, and where is, could be a better place to start talking about predictability than from the words and the works of the person who created the efficient market hypothesis, Eugene Farmer. He's a professor at Chicago, a very conservative, very rigid university. And um, efficient market hypothesis that he first developed in the early 60s, um, and for which basically he got the Nobel Prize in economics in 2013 later, could be formulated in the following way. Weak form of market efficiency states that market prices already reflect all past publicly available information. And hence, adding additional bit of it shouldn't really lead to systematically riskless or risk-adjusted additional profits on top of what could have been achieved with all the other information already available. And the two key words that I would like to highlight here are going to be systematic profits. So like a story of one particular investment or somebody who throws darts and managed to outperform a manager is not going to be an issue here. And the second thing is about riskless or risk-adjusted profits. Because whenever we talk about returns, there is another dimension of that return that we should also emphasize, and that is risk. So just achieving high rate of return does not necessarily mean that there are arbitrage opportunities. Because quite often in the markets where there are lots of really smart and sophisticated people, those high returns, they tend to be accompanied for different sources of risk. Okay? And what happened historically in the empirical work with the data is that up until 80s, any sort of predictability that has been identified in the market has been usually assumed to be a signal of market inefficiency. That is, if I manage to predict the prices for the next period, for example, with relatively high degree certainty, then I could try to trade on it and I could get additional profits. And people have been using both reduced form and fundamental analysis and technical analysis like indicators and candles and everything else in order to predict where the market is going to go and how to profit from it. So one of the basic and simplest tests for predictability could be, for example, the following, uh, let's say, factor or autoregressive process. So I know something at period T, I'm going to call it FT, the factor, and I try to predict what should be the return next period. If it's going to be positive, I'm going to be buying. If it's going to be negative, I'm going to be selling. As I said, this predictability, whenever there was an evidence for it, was usually interpreted as a sign of market inefficiency. But again, that was up until 80s. That is no longer the case. And basically, the topic of this lecture today, at least the first half of the talk, is going to be precisely why it is no longer the case. OK. So in the previous talk, we saw very compelling evidence that there is a lot of predictability on the market, that people could be irrational and they could behave in the models which are not consistent with whatever the rational assumption is going to imply for their behavior. Does it really mean that everything that we know about rational asset pricing or models that played um, from you know, strategic fundamental interaction with micro foundations and everything else is wrong? I think that is going to be a challenge for the EMH, but challenge is accepted. So I will try to also be some sort of a devil advocate in this talk today, and I will try to present an alternative hypothesis saying that actually rationality is still alive and it is still kicking, and there is a lot that we can learn from it as well. OK, so let's look at the empirics and the basic facts. Let's uh, take a very simple return. Um, let's say linear regression, where I'm looking at the market returns on value-weighted index of different stocks traded on several exchanges in the United States. Okay? And I'm going to regress it on the past return on that index. And I'm going to use it not only for stocks, but let's say for, uh, for also T-bills, the government bonds in the US, and also for the excess stock return, which is the difference between the stock index and the return on the bonds. And I will see how much predictability I can get out of it by using just a simple autoregressive process. Well, if I look at the stocks, then actually not much. It turns out that the R square is virtually zero. Uh, the coefficient is insignificant. These are Hans and Hodrick standard errors for those of you who focus on time series. So kind of reasonable way to conduct inference here. The situation is going to be quite different if I look at bonds. Returns on bonds in general are very persistent and they're highly predictable. Okay? There are lots of models that try to explain that, 
but the focus of today's talk is going to be really on stocks alone. So if I look at the excess stock returns, not only is it going to be characterized by the very high volatility, as you can see from the graph here, um, but also by the fact that once you subtract whatever that persistent little bit of the bonds is there, it's actually, again, nothing much that you can predict by using just past return information alone. Okay? So that is going to be fact number one. Does it mean that there doesn't exist other models that are going to do better at predicting returns? Of course not. Here is another regression. Here, I'm trying to predict not only, let's say, daily returns or quarterly, but I'm looking at medium and long horizon returns. So in particular, the frequency of one year or five year returns. And I'm going to use not the past information contained in the stock market index as the predictor, but I'm going to use something which is called price dividend ratio, which is basically the ratio between the price, the level of the index that was, let's say, at the beginning of the period, divided by the total amount of dividends that are going to be paid out during this period. Okay? And what you can find out is that actually that is the regression that gives you quite a bit of predictability. It's not stellar, it's not massive, but there is something there. Okay? Even if you do the inference in a very sophisticated way, way to which we're going to come back later, but nevertheless, there is still a certain degree of predictability. And as you move to lower and lower horizon, so let's say five-year returns or seven-year returns, you see that the quality of this forecast is also going to be improving. Okay? So for instance, if I try to predict five-year returns with just the price-dividend ratio, then I'm going to get something like an R-score about 30%. In short, um, it's very difficult to predict returns at a short horizon, let's say daily, weekly, monthly. The long-term horizon, much easier. In particular, when we're talking about year data, when we're talking about five-year returns, we're talking about something which corresponds to the business cycle frequency. Okay. This is not just a random regression. Apart from Eugene Farmer, who got the Nobel Prize in 2013, he also shared with two other people. And this is the person number two. His name is Robert Schiller. And... Um, he was the first to run the regression that I showed you on the previous slide. His work showed that stock market returns are predictable, but also not on the short horizon, on the long ones. Okay? And again, initially, this evidence was interpreted as the failure of the efficient market hypothesis, because there is no way that you should be able to predict where the market is going and to make money of it. Uh, further, his other body of work He's done tremendous work with data, with relates to high housing and interest rates and bubbles and everything else. He basically advocated that all these predictability and patterns that we observe in financial markets, they're not going to be consistent with a simple rational expectations hypothesis. So you need to really delve into behavioral models in order to explain whatever is going on. Well, it is debatable and it's still a big question in the economics whether it is really true or not. Why is that? Rationality assumption is not there because it's just beautiful. It is. But um, rationality assumption is something that presents you some sort of a comms razor. It allows you to think about economic decision making in basically any context that you can think of. Be it the decision of the housing. Um, what is the optimal policy? How to match, let's say, which kids should go to which school in order to get best social results? How to determine what should be the optimal investment in the portfolio, how to decide how much bequest or to leave to your children, how to decide whether to take insurance or not and what should be the optimal pricing mechanism in the market or in general market design. All of these questions can be answered starting from a very simple assumption of rationality. One of the disadvantages of the behavioral models so far is that it is not entirely clear how to go from the micro level to the macro implications. Let me again sort of allude to the previous um, example. Chess. There is no way that we can find a national equilibrium and play in a chess game, right? Absolutely. But do we think that this really matters for the macro decision, for the inflation that is hitting the country? What about other experimental evidence? There is ample evidence that people are not perfectly rational when they play games, when they behave in different situations. The question is to which extent that is going to have an aggregate impact on the economy. 
there is no way that economists actually do believe that people who make various decisions, they compute integrals and Bellman equations and all in their hands, making all these complicated uh, calculations just instantly on the spur of the moment. Or they have perfect recall and they're able to calculate strategically, taking into account all the actions of the other players. No, we don't believe that. What we do believe, however, is that the outcome of whatever decision making that they do carry out in their heads is actually pretty damn well described by a simple assumption of rationality. So in a way, we pretend that people are rational. We think that they behave as if they were rational. Individual decisions can very well depart from perfect recall, from rationality and strategic thinking. However, on aggregate, quite often those inefficiencies are going to wash out. That doesn't mean that the aggregate model is going to be very simple. There are going to be lots of market complications and lots of frictions and lots of difficulties that arise from just normal life limitations. Capital requirements for banks. Simple fact that I have only limited access to liquidity. Uh, lots of other reasons. And once you take those into account, you are able to rationally explain a lot of findings that have been identified in the previous literature as behavioral including bubbles, including runs on banks, including stable and unstable equilibria, and many, many others. So the question is basically, to which extent want to go or make assumptions in order to answer the question that you're interested in? Um, and obviously, we may be different in our points of view, but I think one of the key things to understand here is that actually there is not much different in the way we think about the world. Both economists, agent-based or rational-based or behavioral economics, they're always going to assume that there are some shocks. And they have agents that live in the economy. The only difference that stands between us is the propagation mechanism of that shock. From this point of view, RBC models or DSG models are not fundamentally different from everything else. The question is the mechanism. Which one you believe, which one is going to be true, and whether the policy making within this model is going to be internally consistent. Say, I have a very sophisticated banker that is going to manage billions of dollars. That often happens. Individual people do manage millions of dollars quite often. He's got two PhDs in physics and economics. He's got access to all these computational technologies that we have today. Probably he's going to do a really good job at computing whatever integrals he needs in order to price different securities and make decisions. Whatever you place certain rules in place, be it the capital requirements for banks, or be it various contracts that a bank is going to require to satisfy in order to get mortgage, typically people are pretty good at getting around those rules. That unfortunately is reality. So rule-based thinking may approximate reality, but not always. And the question is whether that is going to be suitable for the decision maker, for the one who is important for the aggregate macro variables. Okay, so let's go back to the image. Early empirical evidence showed that indeed market returns are predictable. And they're predictable by a whole number of different characteristics, in particular price to dividend ratio. Does that mean that markets are inefficient? The first thing to recognize here is that when we're testing hypothesis, whether the coefficient here, for example, is statistically different from zero or not, is that we're not just taking market efficiency hypothesis and, and testing it directly. We're actually doing a joint test. On top of assuming market efficiency, we also assume that this predictive model is going to be linear. We assume that the expected returns on the security, in this case market index, are going to be constant. They're going to be constant over time. We also assume, of course, all the other technical assumptions that allow us to make the tests. So if we are going to reject the hypothesis, we actually don't know which one of those four things we are rejecting. Is it really EMH? Or is it the fact that without this predictor, the expected returns on the stock market are constant across times? So since the 80s, the predominant kind of belief in economics is that the main problem is going to be assuming that expected returns on the security are constant. There is a lot of empirical evidence, starting from analysis of server expectations and everything else, that shows that risk aversion is time varying in the economy. Let's say during the downturn of the cycle or during the upturn of the economy, people take risks in a very, very different way. They perceive risks in a different way. There could be different um, ideas why does it happen, starting from just implicit time varying risk aversion, or the so-called long-run consumption risk, which comes with the models of Bansal Yaron, for example. 
or time valued opportunities for risk sharing. Let's say when you have various capital constraints and like housing collateral, how is it going to affect you depending on whether you have positive or negative shocks. The point is simple. This thing is not constant. So when I find out that I have something which is predicting excess returns on the stock market, for example, the reason why I'm going to find out is because it predicts expected part of return and not because it offers me something in additional. Okay? So it's not an arbitrage opportunity. It's just we're capturing the time series variation of returns. Why things something like price dividend ratio should actually have any impact on returns? Is there any logic to expect? Or should we just try to get all variables possible and then test which one is going to be really predicting returns and in which case? Well, there is actually a very reasonable and very logical reason for that. Okay? So without taking any models into account, let us start with just accounting identity. What is a return? A return on the security is going to be composed in the two parts. There is the dividend yield and there is the capital gains. Because if I buy the stock today, I know that during this period, let's say one year from now, I'm going to get the dividend and I'm going to sell the stock at the price PT plus one. And so the sum of the two components is going to be precisely my total return on the security, in this particular case, the market. Okay? So one thing that I could do with this is I could just try and rewrite this expression in terms of precisely the price dividend ratio. Okay? Just dividing the same thing, numerator and denominator. And then I'm going to log linearize this expression around the steady state. So I'm basically going to assume that I'm going to consider some, some small fluctuations around, let's say, the steady state level of price to dividend ratio, which is pretty constant, and around the kind of long run mean of returns, which also tend to be relatively constant. Okay? So once I log linearize it, I can substitute it back. So the return on the security is going to be uh, depending on different things. It's going to depend on the year. Oh, sorry. It's going to depend on the price. It's going to depend, obviously, on the dividend that I'm going to be receiving next term, the change in the growth of those dividend rates, and the price to dividend ratio. Again, it's just an accounting identity. What can I do with it now? Well, I can have solve forward this um, expression because I can write down the price dividend ratio from this equation as basically a function of the price dividend ratio next period. The, expected, the growth of the dividends that is going to happen and the return that I'm going to have on the security against uh, over the next period. Okay? So I can keep iterating this expression going forward, 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 and forward, basically just doing forward iteration. Okay? So let's say this is how this expression is going to look like for k periods from now. Again, there is no model here. It's just the counting identity and the definition of what is a return. The only assumption that I will have to make now is that whenever I'm going to go to infinity, I'm going to assume that changes in the price to dividend ratio are going to go to zero if I'm going to discount them by relatively high rate. Basically, what it means is that there should be no bubbles on the market in the long run, at least. Okay? So the market is relatively stationary, and I'm going to consider deviations around that stationary equilibrium. So once I do that, I get the expression which expresses or shows that the price to dividend ratio is going to be a function of the expected changes in returns, you know, expected returns on my security, and expected changes in the dividend growth rate. Okay? This is a very famous expression, which is called Campbell Schiller decomposition. And this is precisely the reason why we should expect to see any sort of um, predictability in the market return when it comes to the price dividend ratio. Why? Because it simply comes from the definition of the objects. In particular, we know that conditional on the fact that expected returns and dividend growth are going to be both stationary, when there is a deviation in the price dividend ratio from its long run mean, okay, that means that either this term or this term also needs to change. It just, they cannot move in opposite direction. Okay? So either both of them can also change in such a way that, again, this identity is going to hold true. And again, I'm not here making any assumptions on the data generating process. It's just the definition of returns. Okay? So this means that I could run a bunch of different predictive regressions. So let's say I could take my returns, I could take it how they deviate from their long run mean, and I could try to test whether those returns can be explained by whatever was the behavior of the price dividend ratio from the period before. Again coming from the idea that if I see today 
a change in the price dividend ratio, it should forecast either future returns or future growth in the dividends. I could also do the same regression, let's say, for the dividend growth and try to check whether it somehow is going to react to the change in the prices from the previous period before, or whether the change in prices are going to react to the changes in, again, price dividend ratio. So all three regressions, they're basically just a consequence of one simple equation. And the regression number one is the one that I showed you before, trying to predict returns with the price dividend ratio. Okay. Now, um, obviously, things change quite a bit since 1984, when first this relationship was discovered. Not only now we have much more data, a lot of variables, we have a lot more observations, and obviously better technical tools in order to deal with various potential predictors of the asset returns, but we also have even new data sets. We have access to high frequency observations, we have access to just things that were not recorded before. Just last week, for example, I found out that there is a fantastic data set of every single complaint on the household about financing in the States. Okay? So let's say if I think that my mortgage was not calculated fairly, or if um, I get a call from the debt that actually I already paid a long time ago, all these complaints are public information. Half a million observations over the last couple of years. All this is in public domain. All this can be freely analyzed by researchers. So, what do we do now? Where we are at this stage? We know the price dividend ratio predicts returns. But what we also know from the last 20 years is that there are a ton other variables that also tend to predict market returns. A lot of them are going to be based on various economic characteristics, on various accounting identities, such as labor income to consumption, various credit spreads, things that are going to be related to the interest rates on the economy, consumption wealth ratio, earnings to price ratio, and many, many, many others. This doesn't really give you like a full list, list of predictability that has been found in the papers in the academic research. It probably is about 5% of what has been identified. But this is what at least I could come up sort of on top of my head. And all these things not only have just some statistical results of predictability, but quite often also have important stories behind why it should matter. What should be the decision making of the agent in order to actually be consistent with whatever we observe in the data. Another important thing that has been found empirically is that usually whenever you go to low frequency returns, let's say five year horizon or seven year horizons, all this predictability tends to be increasing. Okay? So if we really want to understand what is going on with the predictability here and how to do inference, that is another thing that we should also take into account. So at the stage that we are now, it's actually pretty miserable in the sense that we have so many different variables that seem to predict market returns at different horizons that it is really difficult to reconcile all this empirical evidence together. And uh, one of my colleagues used to call it the prediction zoo because we have just way too many things to work with. We need to understand what exactly is going on and why are we generating so many empirical results in data. Okay? One paper in particular makes a really step forward in terms of emphasizing how important and, to be honest, how ridiculous is the current situation in the prediction literature. And that is going to be Novel Marx 2014, which is probably one of the most sarcastic papers that I have seen, and you will soon see why. Novel Marx identifies um, a series of new important predictors, not only for the market returns, and this was the focus of all the studies that I have listed in the previous slide, but also on the performance of some of the trading strategies some of those strategies that have been used basically by mutual funds, by institutional investors over not just like 10 years horizon, but like 20 and 30 years horizon. But here are some of the factors that he has found as significant predictors of the market return. And among them are going to be the weather, El Nino phenomenon, it's the cyclicality in the temperatures, in particular on the West Coast, global warming, sunspot activity, and even angles between planets. All these things seem to be predicting asset returns. The question is, why? The another question is, what, can, how can we differentiate between them, if not based on the statistical identity? Maybe we can think about the mechanism. And again, the problem is that most of them even have a potential explanation because, behind them. Let's look at the weather. Uh, there is a paper by Kamstra, Kramer, and Levy that look at uh, returns that come during the winter months and during the summer months. 
And they basically argue that in the cold demands, you do observe statistically high returns. Why is that? One of the explanations that they come up with is coming from the psychology literature. During the autumn and winter months, many people suffer from what is called the seasonal affective disorder. They are sad, okay? Since they are sad, there are also some empirical evidence suggesting that this could lower their risk appetite of the investors. And if they now have less desire to hold risk, they basically don't really want to buy stocks, other portfolios, or risky securities. So the price on them goes down. Okay. So if the price of them goes down, that means that the interest rates, in order to convince those people to have them in the portfolio, they need to go up. And this explains high return in the winter months. In spring, the sun comes, everyone is happy, everyone is green, there are lots of flowers, the situation is reversed. They're happy, they're willing to take stocks, the depression is gone, and the markets kind of bounce back. Now, the problem is that there is another study by Kai and Wei, 2006, that says that lower temperature can lead to aggression. Again, coming from various results from the empirical psychology literature. And that aggression could result in the risk-taking behavior. If it results in the risk-taking behavior, that means that when the temperature is low, I'm actually willing to buy all the risky stocks. I'm willing to make lots of different bets because I am aggressive. And as such, the impact on the returns should be the opposite to the channel that I have just expressed. Okay? So which one is it? Is it high risk aversion in the winter? Is it lower risk aversion in the winter? We don't know. Why we don't know? Because there is another paper by Hirschleifer and Shumway that say that psychological evidence and causal intuition predict that sunny weather is associated with upbeat mood and that sunshine is strongly significantly positively correlated with stock returns. In winter, especially in New York, there is not much sun going around. So strictly speaking, we would expect that, again, winter returns need to be lower compared to the summer returns. So again, which one is it? Not only these papers, they basically contradict each other in terms of the mechanism in which this difference in returns could be realized, but they even cannot agree about simple empirical facts. Is it winter or is it spring? Novi Marx finds that cold weather in Manhattan really predicts not just market return, but actually return to lots of other strategies that have been used by institutional investors over the years, such as strategies which are based on stocks with small market capitalization, the so-called value companies that I'm also going to talk a little bit about them later, and many others. Hot weather in Manhattan leads to abnormally high performance of many earnings related to anomalies. So it's not just the market, but actually even the nature of those stocks matters. It seems like in winter, traders prefer particular types of securities, and that in summer, they prefer a different type of securities for whatever reason. What is the real explanation? Why is this observed? It's really difficult to say. And what makes it even harder to rationalize compared to all those psychological stories from before is that I could actually use not just the weather in New York, but I could equally successfully use the weather in Bermuda, where obviously none of those traders are located. So to be honest, they shouldn't really give a damn about what is the temperature in Bermuda, whether it's winter or whether it's spring, and get exactly the same significant results. Okay? So this is definitely a challenge for empirical as surprising. What about stars and planets? Stars and planets are going to be another example where similar things arise. Um, there is a paper by Yi Zheng and Zhu, 2006, that says that since psychological studies associate full moon phases with depressed mood, the study hypothesizes that stocks are valued less and their return is going to be lower during full moon periods. Okay? So depending on whether it's going to be a full phase of the moon or whether it's going to be a new moon, we also should have substantially different market returns. And obviously, since it's easy to predict when it's going to be the full phase or not, then we should be able to predict market returns. This is weird. Why is this weird? Because again, just one slide back, I showed you another paper that shows you that when there is depression, then the, it should lead to an increase in expected return. So again, which one is which? Novi Marx focuses not only on the moon, but he goes one step further. He looks at the celestial angles and the impact of the sunspots. In particular, this quote was so lovely, I just couldn't resist putting it on the slide. The aspect of Mercury and Venus with the other planets appear particularly important for the performance of anomalies predicting the returns on the market, strategies based on market capitalization of those companies, book to market, momentum, gross profitability, and so on and so forth. 
Mars, in turn, seems to be very important for some of the trading strategies, which are going to be um, based on various risk taking. And high level of solar activity seem to inhibit investors' capacity to process information, which again comes from some of the empirical studies. And therefore, it should reduce the rate at which news get incorporated into prices. Maybe this is why we see that some of those strategies which are based on kind of slow information processing, they seem to be doing really well in those times. Okay? In short, we have no idea what's going on with empirical asset pricing. The more data we have, the more observations we try, the more variables we consider from all sorts of spheres, be it planet, be it weather in Bermuda, be it the weather in Manhattan or anything else, we're going to find quite often some sort of predictability. So should we just you know, give up and accept the fact that everything is predictable, we don't know why, and we do not really agree to which extent or what is the mechanism, but let's just live with it. Maybe we should think a little bit more about the methodology that we use in order to answer that question. And here comes a guy number three that also shared the same Nobel Prize in economics in 2013. And that was Lars Hansen. Lars Hansen was an econometrician. And he developed so many different approaches to estimating and testing lots of different models in both macro and finance that his contribution, in particular to this talk, is going to be absolutely invaluable. So let's think about the technical side of analyzing this sort of data and using this time series predictive regressions. There are actually many concerns about them that we should try to take into account. Well, the first being obviously the in-sample versus out-of-sample performance. A simple test whether those strategies are going to work out of sample and not just have a high in-sample R square are going to eliminate more than half of them. Okay? Um, persistence and cyclicality of regressors. I'm going to come to that a little bit later. We obviously quite often do not have enough observations in order to have really high power and be able to say reliably what is consistent with the model hypothesis or not. But unfortunately, that's the data that we have right now. A couple of years in the future, we're going to have more data and we can revisit the empirical evidence. That's the beauty of the time series. We can always get more. There could also be some instability with respect to the linear relationship and different structural breaks. And I will also show you some of the empirical evidence that actually this could also lead to spurious predictability found in those regressions. And there's obviously going to be the issue of model selection. Before we run different specifications, we need to choose which one we're going to be dealing with. Finally, there's going to be the issue of the so-called p-hacking and multiple testing. So the rest of the talk is going to be basically going precisely through those reasons and eliminating some of those predictable components that seem to be present in the market. Okay, and two main solutions that we're going to be using here. One is going to be trying to impose a structural model to better understand what those regression coefficients actually stand for, what do they mean, how they correspond to the data generating process and its features. And the second approach is going to be just brute force proper statistics. Really good tests. All right. Let's look at the persistence first. Uh, one observation that often comes in mind when we try to think especially about those ratios like price to dividend ratio or earnings to price ratio and everything else is that they're very persistent. Is it a problem for these predictive regressions? Actually, it turns out that yes, it is a pretty big problem. And here's the reason why. Imagine that I have, oops, there is a typo, I think, here, because this is supposed to be x. Imagine that I have a simple linear regression where I try to predict returns with some sort of a factor, price dividend ratio. But on top of that, I know that this xt, the price dividend ratio, is fairly persistent, which we can model, for example, with an autoregressive process of order one. Now, with the typical assumptions on the structure of the innovations, let us think on the behavior of the OLS estimate here. Well, first of all, it's obviously going to be a simple OLS estimate that is going to be centered around the true value of beta. But the important thing is that we can decompose it. This is rho. This is x and this is rho. Apologies for the double typo. So, but what we can do with it, we can basically express it as the impact of two terms. On one hand, there is going to be the usual kind of OLS component. But on the other hand, there's going to be the impact of the uh, strong persistence, really autocorrelation, that is going to be part of that price dividend ratio. Innovations between the two can also be related to each other. So you basically need to take that into account. What does it mean? That means that if you look at the 
estimate of the coefficient beta here, the predictive component of the price dividend ratio, is going to be biased. Okay? That's just the nature of the predictability. And that's just simple econometrics 101. The coefficient is going to be biased. The question is by how much? If the persistence in the price dividend ratio is really not that high, then the bias is going to be only in small sample. So it's still going to appear that the standard errors need to be adjusted or you need to correct your estimate of the OLS parameter coefficient, but that's not the end of the world. The end of the world is going to happen when you understand that the price dividend ratio is an almost unit root process. Okay? So price dividend ratio is very persistent. It's almost a non-stationary non time series. Almost, but not quite. One of the modeling tools that is used in order to describe this sort of processes is an autoregressive kind of coefficient here where you have what is called local to unity asymptotics. So we're basically assuming that the time series is like stationary for every single finite horizon, but as t goes to infinity, it approaches the unit root process. Okay? It's a very simple way and very convenient way of thinking what are going to be the properties of the estimator in this case. And once you understand that this is really an empirically relevant scenario for the majority of those predictors, then what you see is that the behavior of that OLS estimate, the beta that we use in the predictive regressions, is totally different. It's radically different. It's not just a sample selection bias or whatever, but it's going to be a huge problem with the inference. All the asymptotics breaks down. Whatever you learn about OLS, GMM, or even like new OS correction, nothing works anymore. In fact, the distribution of the parameter is going to be not even a mixture of normals. It's going to be a combination of various diffusion processes, and it's going to be really, really hard to deal with it in any basically reasonable way. Now, the, another issue is that if you move to the long horizon regressions, remember the thing where you first try to predict, let's say, monthly returns with the price dividend ratio, and then we move to like five year horizons, seven year horizons, and it was actually seeming like it works better and better and better. It turns out that if you have a persistent regressor and you move to long horizon, then this problem is going to be even worse. So actually, you're going to see really high predictive values. You're going to see standard statistic really rejecting the null hypothesis of no predictability and telling you that, yeah, this is a really important factor with really high probability. The R square is also going to be inflated. In short, predictability of the regressor for these types of models is an absolute crucial thing to take into account. And it's really, really difficult to take into account properly. There have been several solutions uh, suggested in the literature based on Bonferroni method and conditional likelihood with sufficient statistics. Probably the best um, right now which is available is going to be the um, AVX method. Basically, it's a method of constructing um, instruments, a particular type of instruments, which is suggested in the papers by Phillips and Lee and then extended one year later also in the Journal of Econometrics paper. Okay? So in short, this is fairly new. This is fairly complicated. But it's the thing that actually works and that can be trusted. And obviously that once you take this persistence into account, a lot of the results are going to unfortunately disappear. What about the weather? Well, actually just one look at those predictors that have been used in the Noel Marx paper is going to be enough to tell you that, yes, that is exactly the reason why the weather in Bahamas or in New York City is going to be a significant predictor of many market anomalies and returns. Why? because it's very, very persistent and it's very, very cyclical. Again, it's almost a unit root process. What about getting sort of a structure in the economy? Again, let's assume simple, very simple data generating process. Where let's say my dividends, my dividend growth, is going to depend on some persistent component. There is going to be innovations to those dividend growth. Returns are going to, again, also have some sort of component inside that depends on some sort of factor. This is going to be a very, very simple model with the latent variables. And the idea is just to model the simple notion that there is a part which varies a lot and there is a part which is fairly low frequency, fairly persistent, such as, again, various pricing ratios. The fundamental accounting identity, from remember those decomposing expected change in dividends, expected returns, and the price dividend ratio that I observed today, is going to imply that actually there are only three shocks in this economy. Okay? So there's going to be a shock to the expected dividend, there is going to be a shock to the expected returns, and there's going to be a shock to the unexpected dividends. Okay? 
Why? Because everything else is going to come from that equality. Okay? So while it looks like there are basically four epsilons here, in fact, there are three because of that equality. So um, assume again that we have fairly persistent process, but totally stationary. So nothing of that weird stuff that was in the previous slide. Okay? Very, st very simple system, stationary process. And assume that some of those innovations can be correlated. In particular, what if there is a correlation between a shock with expected returns and expected dividends? What can we get out of it? Well, we know that according to that system, the returns they should be predicting by only that persistent component of the price dividend ratio. The problem is that we actually don't observe that persistent component alone. What we observe is the persistent part plus the shock. Okay? And what does it mean for our regression? It means that we have an error invariable problem. So whenever we're going to try to regress on the just observed changes in the price dividend ratio, we're going to be regressing not only on what is relevant for the returns, but stuff which is completely orthogonal to it. Okay? And that means that the coefficient that we're going to be getting is going to be biased. Depending on the particular correlation structure and whether you believe that, let's say, news about the dividends, unexpected news about the dividends, are going to have somehow some sort of correlation with the, my expectation about future returns of the company, I'm going to get a bias. And that bias could be both upward and downward sloper. So recent decade saw a lot of new data sets with regards to the formation of the expectations of people. Let's say the survey of professional forecasters, which um, provide a lot of information. Uh, there is a lot of data with regards to uncertainty measurement in the economy and so on and so forth. And it has indicated that, indeed, this bias can further explain something like 20% of the predictability that we seem to be seeing in the data. Let's move on. What about parameter instability? Let's go back to the same regression that I have been using from slide, I think, number three. So we try to predict returns with a price dividend ratio. But let's try to use various rolling windows of, for example, 30 years. Okay? So I'm going to estimate the model in the first 30 years, and I'm going to move a little bit further, estimate it again, and so on and so forth. And let's look at how coefficient of that model and how the R square, the predictive measure of fit, is going to be changing over time. If it was really a you know, normal linear relationship, that you would expect them to be fairly constant. In practice, it is not. Not only in practice you see that the coefficient of predictability is changing, it's like really, really changing, it's jumping all over the place. But actually, one thing that you can notice is that a lot of the predictability is going to be coming only from the period of the oil crisis, of the oil shocks in the US. This happens not only because of the significance of the T-stats, but even R squared, let's say, here and here was close to zero. Here, it was about 30%, which again obviously contradicts the assumption that we make inference under which. And once you take into account structural breaks that are obviously present in this relationship, again, a lot of the predictability goes away. Well, I listed several of the problems with the data, but probably like a really definite kind of nail in the coffin of a lot of these predictability regressions <coughs> came with a paper by Goyle and Welsh, um, who showed that once you do the inference correctly, <coughs> once you update the data set, <coughs> and once you really look what was the behavior of the parameters in the model, a lot of those predictability results that have been found in the prior literature, first of all, they really were never there in the first place. And second, they don't really work out of sample. <coughs> what about multiple testing? Multiple testing is a really interesting thing and something that really became an issue with the development of big data techniques, in particular in um, the study of genes. <clears throat> what was the idea there? Imagine that I have 20 different predictors, and I'm going to just throw in them one by one. Okay? We're going to try variable number one, see if it's going to predict my market return. I'm going to try variable number two, and again, see if it's going to predict market return. Well, normal people would expect that a reasonable way to conduct inference here <coughs> would be to just look at these stats one by one, okay? If it comes significant from regression number one, cool, I have found my significant predictor. If it comes from number two, even better, I'm gonna have two significant predictors, and so on and so forth. What is the problem with this approach? The problem is that if you try long enough, there's always gonna be a probability that you're gonna just randomly find something significant which is not there. Here's a simple numerical example. <clears throat> Imagine that I'm going to be conducting 20 separate tests, and they're independent. Okay? So they basically give me a zero-one outcome. 
the probability of making an, an error here is going to be 5%, the size of the test. And assume that none of those 20 predictors should be significant. What are the chances that by going this one by one, I'm going to find at least one significant predictor? The chances actually are going to be massive, because the idea is going to be that it's one minus the probability, obviously, that none of them is going to be really found as significant due to some shock, and that's going to be 64%. Okay? So while for each of those tests in particular, the chances that I'm going to identify something significant when it is not there is only 5%, if I try 20, the probability that I'm going to find at least one of them being significant, well, again, none of them really are there, is going to be already 64. And in fact, if I try more and more variables, the probability that I'm always going to find something significant there is going to be approaching one. So how can we deal with this situation? In particular, how can we deal with all those papers and all those regresses that we have now in order to assess this situation? One of the simple solutions that have been suggested in the kind of early literature was the so-called Bonferroni correction. Again, assume independence, assume that I have n tests, and assume that I have significance level of, for example, 5%. But instead of using this 5% significance level for each of those 20 tests, for each of those 20 tests, I'm going to be using significance level corresponding to 5% divided by 20. Okay? Simple math is going to show you that in this case, the probability of observing at least one significantly identified aggressor is going to be precisely 5%. Now, the problem with the Bonferroni correction is that in general, it's going to be very conservative. So actually, if you look at the properties of, let's say, the power of the test, you will find out that when there is, let's say, one or two really significant factors, and if I use this Bonferroni correction, then actually I'm going to have a really difficult time trying to recover it from the data. Okay? So this is why there have been suggested some other solutions which are less conservative that try to achieve the same goal. And they focus on the so-called family type of error. So again, to make sure that we do not just randomly come across something which is significant, but at the same time, we're able to get the most information available from the whole data set. And the best reference here is going to be Annals of Statistics paper by Roman and Wolf. Okay? That's basically state of the art, and it really works very well. Okay. Once you do this, again, a bunch of predictors is going to disappear. So we basically managed to route the majority of the variables that we started in the first place. Some of them are technical indicators, some of them are fundamental, but most of them tend to go away. To be fair, price dividend ratio remains. It's not very, very strong, but it's still fairly robust that it seems to have some sort of predictive component for the lower frequency returns. Does it mean that there is no hope for predictability left? So nothing seems to be really predicting markets once we do econometrics right. No, not at all. And I'm going to give you three examples where there is still going to be a substantial degree of predictability. And those three examples are going to be using three different methods in order to assess and understand what is going on there. One of them is going to be based on sort of fundamental economic analysis, and that's going to be about FOMC announcements. I will explain in a minute what is it. That one is going to be on the application of the thing and the method that you're going to probably hear a lot about during the rest of the course, in particular, I expect from Victor, is going to be about Lasso. And the third one is going to be from the machine learning industry, and that's going to be the application of the random forest. Okay, what is the FOMC announcement? FOMC stands for Federal Open Market Committee. It's a committee that operates in the United States that meets um, on average about eight times a year, and they make decisions regarding the monetary policy outcome. So let's say the interest rates, they communicate a message to the economy, they say that, okay, unemployment is still fairly high, so we're not going to increase the interest rates, we continue to wait until the economy is going to recover, and so on and so forth. In short, that's the monetary policy decision maker. Okay? Um, <clears throat> since 1994, the dates, those announcements, has been known, and every time they meet, then at 2.15 p.m., they come, and I make a short message communicating whatever they have discussed to the people, okay? All the public information, they just go and say a few phrases. You know, again, unemployment is probably still a bit too high, so we decided not to change the interest rates, or we are waiting until something like this happened, we think of the economy going like this, and so on and so forth. So there is a short message regarding the monetary policy. The interesting thing 
is that if you look at the 24 hours, which happened just prior to the announcement of FOMC committee meeting, whatever they have decided, stock market seems to be growing really, really fast during those 24 hours. For comparison, on average, over those days that I have met since 1994, and we're talking about something like 130 days, okay? So 130 days in total. On average, the stock market index increased by roughly 50 basis points in those 24 hours. For comparison, if I take any other 24 hours during this 20 year period, the return is gonna be only about 0.5 basis points, okay? So this is like 100 times more, a lot. What does it mean? That means that if you look at the aggregate return on the stock market that has been accumulating over the last 20 years, actually 80% of that return is happening only on those 130 days. And if you do a simple strategy of just buying like a stock market, like a futures, for example, on S&P 500, just 24 hours prior to announcement, and then selling right before the announcement, you're actually going to make a lot of returns. How much? This is the graphical illustration. Again, if you're making something like 50 basis points per day, on average, this is what you would get from any other day in the economy, okay? So there is still obviously some sort of an increase in the cumulative returns because stock market on average has a positive return. But if you compare from the return that you would get from the strategy associated with the FOMC announcements, it's like nothing, okay? So returns here, they are predictable and they're predictable by a really, really large degree. What exactly is generating this predictability? To be honest, we still don't know. There are some theories, but the majority of them are not consistent with the data. There is a theory that there is some leakage of the information from the uh, FOMC committee to some people because of lobbying and other activity, but as you can imagine, this theory is not particularly popular with the central bankers. So that is still an open question. Where exactly this predictability is coming from? Big data. We have high frequency data, in particular the TAC database. We have thousands of stocks which are being traded on markets and on exchanges and on over the counter markets in particular. Let's imagine that I want to try to predict the return on a particular security today with some of the other returns that happened in the past. For example, let us focus on one minute returns. And I'm going to look at the horizon of just half an hour. Okay, so there are like 30 observations, time series observation for Apple. And I want to try to predict the return on Apple stock that is going to be in the minute number 31. But I want to make use not only the information of the past returns, let's say the, again, Apple returns in minute 30, 29 or 28, but also want to try to test whether any other stocks which are traded on the same exchange could also somehow predict whatever is going to be the behavior of the stock. You cannot assess this thing with OLS. Why? Because think about the number of the predictors here, okay? So if I have even just three lakhs of each of the security, and I have two and a half thousand securities trading at New York Stock Exchange, I'm talking about an OLS regression with 30 observations and roughly seven and a half thousand regressors. There is no way that I can identify the parameters. And this is where the thing which is going to be very useful, the lasso, comes in. The lasso is the idea that we're going to penalize some of those parameters that we try to estimate. With the idea being the following. Out of those 7,500 potential regressors that I have available out there, actually only a small number of them are really important and significant. So I'm trying to estimate the parameters by not just minimizing sort of the quality of my fit and forecast, but also penalizing how many non-zero coefficients I'm going to have in the model, okay? So chances are that if indeed I have this sparsity in the return generating process, out of those seven and a half thousands, I will be able to choose only four or five variables that are gonna have non-zero coefficients, the beta associated with them, and everything else is going to be exactly zero, okay? I don't want to spend that much time talking about Lasso and its properties, both asymptotic and finite sample, because again, I'm sure that that is going to be discussed in really detail during the rest of the school, being sort of the thing about big data and the tool in analyzing the big data. But I would like to offer a little bit of something like a um, graphical interpretation why I have these exactly zero solutions. The reason why I have these exactly zero solutions is because here I'm using the L1 norm. How does the norm look like? It has a minimum at zero, 
And then whenever I have a non-zero coefficient, it's going to be some positive number. Okay? So imagine that this is something like an OLS solution. Okay? So I'm going to try to optimize with the OLS solution, try to minimize the sum of squares, and I'm going to look at the L1 norm, which is going to be posed by those regressors. So here, there's an example graphical illustration with only two regressors. Okay? So the solution is going to be basically trying to somehow marry these two things so that I still can try to explain the OLS part of the predictive regressor, but I'm not going to be using too many variables inside. And because of the four L1 penalty, the solution can have exact zeros as just the object of optimization, not the insignificant regressors, but just zero in final sample. In contrast, if I were to use, for example, an L2 penalty here, again, I would achieve some sort of a shrinkage. So it will make some of those parameters smaller because if they are too large, that's going to be contribute to the penalty, but I'm never going to be able to get exactly zero as a solution. That's the beauty of the lasso because it combines model selection, variable selection, and estimation of those parameters at the same time. So what do people find? The people find that once you look at those high frequency returns, actually it seems like lasso can really improve on the performance of the predictive regressors. And these are going to be out of sample. And there is no issue with persistence because the returns, they're pretty much IID. Okay? So actually, a lot of those critiques that I was talking about in the predictive regressions before, they're not going to be applicable here. And on average, if you look across all those 2,500 stocks which are traded on exchanges, Lasso helps to boost out-of-sample predictability by 23%. This result is not going to be uniform across different industries. In some cases, the returns on some stocks are going to be actually particularly important for the returns of other stocks, and Lasso will be able to pick them up. One of them, for example, where this thing is really pronounced is going to be the metal mining industry. So this is the case where the stocks on those companies which operate in the metal mining, they seem to be really sensitive to the information about, containing about some other stocks. One of the potential explanations why we see this relationship is because of the very tight supply chain. Okay? So we're really talking about big manufacturing firms. We're really talking about the business where it is important who's going to be your supplier, who's going to be your buyer. So whenever something is happening with a part of the chain, the other company is going to immediately, again, react to this information. Okay? But overall, Lasso helps. What about random forest? Well, Random forest is related to the so-called anomaly of momentum. Momentum was the effect, again related to predictability, that has been identified in, as back as 1993. And the idea was that if you look at the past performance of the stocks, in particular focus on the period from 12 months, one year back, to two months, so excluding the very last month, and you try to sort stocks into those who performed really well in the past, and those who performed not so well in the past, it turns out to be that those who performed really well, they actually tend to continue to perform well. So this is why it's called momentum. And since this uh, idea usually is to build a portfolio where basically sorting the stocks and then buy the winners and sell the losers in order to additionally generate some profits, uh, one of the questions that inevitably becomes, what about all that information in 12 month period? Is it just the aggregate performance over the whole 11 months that I've been accumulating? Or is it one month is more important than the other? Or maybe there is going to be a combination of some months. Or maybe there's going to be some nonlinear uh, tendency between the return of a particular month and whatever is going to happen next to the same stock. Again, all these questions is hard to assess. Lasso is going to be probably one of the potential ways to deal with that, to select which of the predictors are going to be really significant. Another way that has been borrowed from the machine learning literature is to build conditional portfolio sorts. What's the idea? Imagine that I have one variable, okay? And my hypothesis, initial hypothesis, is that, um, is that if I have this variable value being too high, that means that it's going to lead to, let's say, high expected returns in the future. And if that variable is going to be too low for some of the stocks, that means that they're going to have low expected return in the future. I'm going to take all the stocks together. I'm going to try potential values for that threshold variable. Okay? And for each value of the threshold, I'm going to be looking at the stocks that come on the left and the stocks that go on the right. I'm going to compute what is going to be the average return from the stocks on the left 
and the stocks on the right. And the idea is that if the difference between the returns is really substantially large, then it seems like the variable really is going to give me some information or an indicator that I should really separate them. That these guys are the low return and these guys are the high return. The similar sorting, you can continue going forward, forward, and forward. Okay? So basically, it's the type of sorting that tries to minimize within group variation by trying to understand which stocks are similar to each other and maximize the between group variation by trying to really separate them. These are the high return guys and these are the low return guys. And once you do that, you find tons of information. You actually find out that all those effects that contain momentum is hugely nonlinear. And you can improve that a lot. And you can generate various tradable strategies that also gonna give you additional returns using this uh, tree methodology. The strategy payoff on average is gonna be positive and actually pretty large and you think on an annual basis, okay? So this is where machine learning really helped to understand the nonlinearity and really complex nature behind the underlying predictability. To be honest, when I was talking about this momentum effect and which stocks to buy, which stocks to sell, I cheated a little bit. Because the topic of at least the first part of the lecture today was time series predictability. But when I was using these conditional sorts and understanding which stocks I should buy, which stocks I should sell, I didn't try to predict the returns. So it's not like I said, that stock is gonna have a positive return tomorrow, it's gonna grow, so I should be buying it now. What I looked instead was the cross-sectional aspect. I don't know what is going to happen to the stock to the, tomorrow, but I probably have a pretty good idea that the return on Apple is going to be higher than the return on the Microsoft. Therefore, if I build a portfolio that is gonna go long in the Apple, that is going to go short in the Microsoft, basically gonna get larger number minus smaller number, I'm gonna get a positive profit, okay? This is what is called cross-sectional predictability. Because we are not trying to predict the time series of individual returns. Instead, we're trying to understand which of the stocks are going to have high returns and which of the stocks are going to have lower returns. In fact, if you look at the current state of the empirical asset pricing, then you will find out that most of the literature, which is somehow related to predictability, now it's all about cross-section. It's not so much about the time series, but basically everything is about the cross-sectional aspect. And they're gonna be, apart from momentum, there are two more important examples that have been identified quite a long time ago. And these are the so-called value versus growth and big versus small stocks. What's the idea? People have noticed that if you look at the stocks that have different book-to-market ratio, in particular when book-to-market ratio is small, it's called a growth company. Imagine a small business, but that doesn't have a lot of assets, but has a lot of growth opportunities. So people have assigned very high price to its market value because they expect it to develop, they expect it to grow. That's why it's gonna be a growth company. So stocks that with low, have low book to market ratio, the growth companies, they on average have returns lower than the stocks that correspond to the value companies. Big established companies, think of like General Motors, General Electric, so on and so forth. These are the value companies. And this is why it is referred to the so-called value premium. So the trading strategy that is going to exploit it, exploit this cross-sectional predictability, is gonna be try to buy those stocks that are going to have higher returns and sell the stocks that are going to have lower returns in order to benefit from the difference without really spending anything out of your pocket. And this is gonna call it HML, high minus low. So I'm gonna be buying high book-to-market companies and I'm gonna be selling low book-to-market companies. The other effect that has been found a very long time in the market is the size premium, where companies which have relatively small market capitalization, they again tend to have returns higher than companies that have large market capitalization. Small caps, large caps, or big caps. And this is why the strategy that exploits this cross-sectional predictability is called SMB, small minus big. I'm gonna be buying small companies and I'm gonna be selling the shares of the big companies. Um, oops, bro. <clears throat> How do they look like? Um, these are historical returns on this strategy. Where I start with the whole universe of stocks, I sort them based on market capitalization or the market to book ratio. I 
look at the tail, let's say top 30% and bottom 30% among that sorting, and I'm going to be buying the top top 30%, and I'm going to be selling the bottom 30%. Okay? Standard trading strategies. These are going to be return. So as you see, on average, it has been increasing. There have been different crashes, obviously, the one corresponding to the dot-com bubble, for example, and the crisis of 2008, 2009, but it actually offered a decent return compared to everything else. This is momentum, winners minus losers, where I look at the stocks that tend to perform well in the past, and I buy them. And I take the stocks that performed not so well in the past, and I'm going to be selling them. Winners minus losers, momentum. You see that, on average, the cumulative return on the momentum strategy is much larger than the one corresponding to, let's say, value growth or the size premium. Okay? This is why I also had two separate graphs to kind of differentiate the scale. But not only the returns on momentum is actually pretty good, but you see that momentum is also very volatile. Okay? So there have been crashes. Momentum strategy is the sort of thing that you get on average positive and pretty good returns, but you are basically suffering from a probability of experience, maybe not so often happening, but really large negative event. Okay, so obviously when we talk about this, the questions that we have in mind, okay, we have thousands of stocks that are traded on exchanges and even more, more various instruments which are traded on like over-the-counter exchanges, right? Which strategies could we use? For each of those stocks, there are hundreds of variables available. It's not just market capitalization. We could look at profitability. We could look at investment. We could look at liquidity. We could look at pretty much every single thing that we can get from accounting information, which is, again, public and can be downloaded. And you can have a huge database corresponding to each of those 3,000 companies that are traded out there. Okay? You could have all this information. How to choose which ones are going to be important? And once we identified that some of those companies have returns which are higher than others. Does it mean that they are good? Does it mean that they're a good investment opportunity? Should we really be jumping on them and trying to profit from them? Does it contradict efficient market hypothesis? The fact that I have some of the stocks that have consistently returns higher than the other stocks. And what about, for example, an example of convergence trade? Something that we already again saw in the morning where I have two very similar securities that usually behave the same, but I see that they're now quite different. Does it mean, again, that the market is inefficient, that I see these two assets which are similar, but for some reason have different price? Okay? So all these topics are going to be covered in the next half of the talk, because that is going to be about cross-sectional predictability and what empirical asset pricing has to say about that. Okay? And again, I hope that EMH is going to survive it as well and continue staying alive and kicking. Okay, we have, I think, about 10 minutes. So if you have any questions, please feel free. Sure. Thank you. Uh, hi. <laughs> Thank you. It was really perfect. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, actually, I had to different uh, questions and somehow I think they are uh, interconnected. Uh, the thing I want to ask is about the method and your approach, actually your attitude towards the problem. Uh, the first thing is uh, how did you find out that the relationship between the two, these variables are linear and uh, I think um, I'm not sure if they are really uh, um, dependent uh, in a linear manner. And the <coughs> second question is about the uh, <coughs> revolution of formulas and you know models, actually. And that's about uh, why uh, you didn't uh, use something like deep learning uh, to understand, to extract the relationship when you're using the big data, you are able to use simply uh, deep learning and, uh, and after what reverse the you know, uh, neural network and extract the formula, something like this. Uh, the linear relationship in between which, which variables? Like those predictive regressions? I'm actually talking about all source of information and uh, you know, somehow reverse the, in, uh, I, I actually after the 
after that uh, model is trained and everything is okay and you are understanding that everything is really uh, performing good and uh, you need to uh, somehow extract the uh, deep learning, uh, you know, extract the formula from the neural network and get the final somehow. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> thank you for the question. That's, that's actually a really good point. Um, the reason why I started with a linear regressions in particular in this talk simply because they were historically first used. Imagine end of 70s, 80s, it's not very easy even to invert the matrix, so a relatively small dimension, and we're really talking about having this kind of large data sets and thousands of stocks. So linear regressions and linear approach was obviously just the first natural tool to come up with historically. But while a lot of the results that I have already presented and will be presenting in the next part are going to be linear, please don't think so bad about finance. We know proper econometrics. We can estimate very complicated nonlinear models with uh, tons of nonlinearity involved, the kernel regressions and everything else. We are well aware of many methods from statistical learning and from machine, from statistics separately and machine learning. And a lot of them can really get you some additional information in particular applications. So what I present here is not designed to be sort of like, you know, true, so like this is the state of the art, but more to introduce you into the way to think about predictability and not only to think about the statistical concerns that can arise there. In particular, remember that graph with the structural breaks where the quality was changing. Of course, the relationship is nonlinear. That's precisely the point, that the relationship was changing across times. The parameters can be time varying. The dependence on the price dividend ratio can potentially be also nonlinear depending on how you specify different processes. You're absolutely right. This was just the first place to start. And the more people we're going to have that are going to be able to use these tools, and in particular extract information not only from the market return, but the whole large cross-section of individual stocks, high frequency or low frequency, the more we're going to learn about what exactly is going on in the markets. So it's pretty much an open quest for both predictability and explaining what exactly that predictability means. And there are so many written new tools that can be used. I mean, you already saw some of the examples here are the papers from like 2015, 2016. So there is obviously a lot more going to come in the next few years. If you have any ideas what else can be used or why it's going to be applicable in particular series or designs, I would be super happy to discuss. Anything else? Okay, then I'll, I'm not going to let you kind of starve and get away from coffee. So I uh, will meet for the next session soon.